Welcome to Witham Sounding Board, a podcast sharing powerful business tips, insights, and trends for those seeking to become a rock star in their industry. Good day, and welcome to Witham's Lodging and Insights Innovations podcast. My name is Lena Combs. I'm a partner here at Witham and the practice leader of the firm's hospitality services team. Today, I have with me Brian McIntyre, who's a partner in Witham's corporate value consulting services team. Today, we'll be talking about valuations for hospitality and lodging companies and how they can identify when a valuation would be appropriate and what methods are used to perform valuations. Thank you, Brian, for joining us today and talking about this timely topic and providing your insights to the lodging industry. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. So we'll just jump right into it. So Brian, can you explain what a business valuation is and why someone may need to obtain one? Sure, yeah. So generally a, a business valuation is either an appraiser, you know, concluding on let's say 100% of a business um, for potentially like a sale purpose or a specific interest that someone may own in that business itself. So that could be, you know, a minority interest, a controlling interest. They may have equity through, you know, warrants, options, convertible notes, things of that nature. So while it seems, you know, generally related to businesses itself, it can get down to something very narrow, such as an instrument uh, within that business. Then why, you know, why someone may need to obtain it. Uh, it's interesting because when I first started doing business valuation, you think a lot of this will be for transaction purposes, people looking to buy or sell businesses. And we certainly assist with that, but there are a lot of other reasons too, uh, why someone might get the valuation that could be, you know, tax purposes, uh, financial reporting for your, um, financial statements, uh, lending purposes, you're going to a bank to get, um, debt, uh, issued to you. And then also, uh, litigation, right? You could have, uh, matrimonial, shareholder dispute, things of that nature, where someone needs to come in and, and value those assets. I would imagine, too, for gifting purposes, right? I think we've seen a lot lately of um, families who are passing the torch to a new generation and want to gift interests in, in the businesses. Yeah, no, we see a lot of that right now, especially with the exemption um, more than likely going to be reduced by you know, call it about half of what it's been uh, the past year, a few years with the TCJA. Uh, we do a lot of that, whether that's gifting um, or estate, uh, someone passes away, but it's a very active topic. And it's uh, with the IRS funding kind of increasing, you know, the expectation is those appraisals will be more looked at potentially in the future. So uh, putting together credible valuation reports for that purpose is important. Sure. So what are the traditional methods used in business valuations and how do they differ from each other? Because I know there's more than one way to do that. Yeah, and I, I think a, a proper valuation that when you're reviewing those reports will explain why certain methods were used or not. Uh, there's three main methods that appraisers will look at. And I like to use uh, the comparison to housing because I think that kind of resonates with everyone. So there's the asset or cost approach, and that's going to be kind of the cost to recreate the business um, itself or the kind of liquidation value of the business. So usually that'll come into play with businesses that are not making money, that are not profitable. And we'll get into kind of intellectual property value and goodwill going concern value later. But uh, that's probably the least used method. But that, you know, that could involve appraising the company's fixed assets, appraising the company's uh, real estate, or anything else that might be on that balance sheet that's not, uh, the book value is not representative of fair market value. And then you kind of move over to the income approach. So think about, you know, a building that's producing income that can dictate uh, the value of that building. Same thing with the business. That's going to look at the true cash flow of the business. And when I say true cash flow, right, that's not exactly what a business owner has reported. It's, it's really what the business can generate. So one of the common things that we might look at there is the owner's compensation, how they've been paying themselves. Is that you know below or above market to get a true picture of that income? And then the market approach, uh, probably easiest to relate to. If you're selling your house, what did your neighbor down the street sell their house for? You know, what are the differences in their house versus your house? And for businesses, we have a lot of uh, available data on transactions and what those similar businesses have sold for, the multiples that they've sold for. So. 
you have your asset income and market approach. And then within those approaches, you know, you might have different ways um, of applying it, you know, whether, you know, you look at an income approach, it could be the historical uh, performance of the business versus a projection, a market approach could be public companies versus private transactions, uh, et cetera. So how do those market conditions that you were talking about, how do those impact the valuation of a business? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, we've dealt with some of that in the past few years with the rising interest rates. Um, all else equal, if money is more expensive to get, that would be a decrease to the value of business, right? The principle of substitution. So if I, you know, if you, if you place yourself three or four years ago where I could go and I could only get one or two percent on my money risk free, uh, that's not very attractive. And I think you saw a lot of people in the market put their money into more speculative investments, uh, kind of trying to get a return on their cash. And as the interest rates have risen, I can go and I can get a CD or a treasury bond for, let's say, 5%. Um, yeah. The demand then uh, for me to invest um, in a business is going to be higher because I can get that risk-free return. So that's one of the bigger ones. I think the other things to think about we, when you look at market conditions is not to double count. So we have this tendency to say, well, if the, you know, the economy is doing worse, uh, the, the valuation should be lower. And while that's true, you, know, you will see that already play out in the company's financial performance. So it's important not to double count. So if the company's profitability is down due to these economic conditions, that should already all else equal then you know, dovetail into the conclusion. And the same thing with if, you know, the, the economic conditions are good and the business is doing well. Well, if you're applying, let's say, an EBITDA multiple, then that EBITDA itself uh, will be reflective of that. It's interesting, too, when you look at uh, private transactions over time, the multiples are pretty consistent. Uh, again, what changes is really the financial performance. And mm. when you think about market conditions, it is important, you know, whatever date you're valuing a business, it's not necessarily the conditions today, but it's the expectations of the conditions in the future. And that's exactly, you know, how we look at the stock market, et cetera, how, how these businesses are priced. So what role do financial statements play in the business valuation process? Yeah, so that is, you know, one of our main requests whenever we perform a business valuation. Uh, you know, the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow, how they all tie together. So they, they give us a sense of the health of the business, its ability to uh, repay its obligations, its ability to generate income. And I think one of the key distinctions with financial statements that maybe uh, is thought of a little bit differently, you hear a lot of price to earnings talk in the, in the market, which is net income. But really, the value of a business and any business is attributable to its future abilities to produce cash flow, which is different than net income. So while a tax return won't have a full cash flow statement, financial statements uh, will come with a cash flow statement. And it's important because we need to take that net income and we need to get down to the real cash generating ability of the company. And that can be drastically different, you know, in hospitality, for example, if there's a lot of capital reinvestment needs that eat away at that net income, uh, that would, you know, decrease evaluation all else equal. It also will give us insight on the company's um, debt repayment schedules or issuance of any stock. And so holistically, you need all three financial statements, ideally, um, to get the best insight you can on the business. Uh, but there are other documents, right, that we will request uh, as well. Sure. So what are some of those other documents that you would want to see when performing evaluation? Yeah, I think going back to the uh, original question, the, the thing that guides the documents we request sometimes is the purpose. So, for example, if we're doing a, a gifting valuation and we're doing a non-controlling interest there, we want to see the shareholder or partnership agreement to understand the rights of that specific interest we're valuing because for tax purposes, you you know you can make the argument to the IRS. It's very you know almost done universally that a minority interest is not worth its pro rata value to the business. So if a business is worth a million dollars, you know ten percent uh, for tax purposes and not necessarily worth a hundred thousand dollars. So that's one of the main ones uh, that we like to see uh, anytime we're doing evaluation because 
you can't just assume everyone's kind of parent pursue and has the same rights and, and privileges. We also like to look at projections. Uh, as kind of mentioned, it's not what the business has done, it's where the business is going. So we like to have management's insight on where they think the business is headed. Because if you've made a lot of investments over the years that haven't really ref been reflected yet in the performance of the business, it would be unfair uh, to not consider that moving forward. It would uh, potentially undervalue the business. The other things are more uh, call it qualitative. You know, every business valuation uh, includes a management interview. That's about the customers. That's about the history of the business, its workforce, things of that nature. As you know, sometimes we're trying to catch up to a 20, 30 year old business and, you know, a, a four to six week timeline for a project. So we, we need to learn the history of it. Sure. So. We talked a little bit about some of those assets, but how do you intangible assets like intellectual property or brand value factor into the valuation? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think if you take a step back and you look at the market in general and you look at price to book multiples over time, you see a very consistent increase in that. And, and that really infers that we're moving further away from capital intensive businesses, more to service based businesses. And the value of those intangible assets, I think a lot of times some people will get it a bit confused. A good example of that would be a, a liquor license. In, in some states, a liquor license is very valuable um, because there's scarcity to them. And some people will get confused and think the value of the business plus the value of the liquor license is, is the value overall. That is not the case. And it's the same with any intangible asset for the most part. The intangible assets are driving the value of the company because they are helping to create the cash flow. So when you think about uh, a service based business where it has a good reputation or brand in, in the marketplace, that is helping draw customers to their business and that is putting you know, money to the bottom line. And that money and that cash flow is what we're using to appraise the business. So the important distinction is that the intellectual property generally is inclusive of whatever the value of the business is. When you look at the market cap of Apple, that market cap, that equity value includes the value of Apple's technology, trademarks, patents, et cetera. And the same thing happens here where when we conclude on the value of the business, if you take that value less the book value of the company, you can start to get a general idea of what the intangibles and the goodwill is worth in that business. Now, the, the value of it long-term can be impaired by the performance of the business itself. And so it's always important to, you know, for especially, you know, you look at financial reporting, right? There's those impairment issues where the value on day one, when you acquired it may not be the same, you know, year, two, three years from now. Right. So what common mistakes have you seen um, that appraisers might make when estimating the value of the business? Yeah, I think there's a couple main things I would key in on. And I think it's important as, you know, people and business owners, they, they get these appraisals that they're educated enough to uh, push back a little bit. I think it's always good to ask the appraiser questions, how they came up with something. Mm -hmm. You know, we perform the valuations. We like to get on calls with the clients and say, you know, this is the assumption we're making for X, Y, Z. Does this make sense to you? you know, this is your business. Uh, does that generally align with your expectations? And, you know, we can talk through the issues. But when I look at some common mistakes, it goes back, one of them goes back to really the historical versus future performance of the business. And I think from a psychological standpoint, it feels really good for everybody to say, this is what the business did on a trailing 12 months basis, or this is what the five-year average of the business has been. We'll use that to value the company. And that may very well be appropriate, but you could have instances where the historical performance of the business is not necessarily what the future performance is going to be. A good example of that, uh, you know, hospitality related, maybe, uh, you know, we look at COVID, uh, it impacted a lot of businesses. And if you look at potentially a limited service restaurant, a lot of those that we saw had, had a huge up, uh, uptick in, in business because people were doing takeout or, uh, you know, Grubhub, et cetera. And that's not sustainable. Uh, usually, right? As people went out and went to full service restaurants, you saw that business dip. So it's important for the appraiser, again, to going back to the market conditions, you know, understanding, you know, is it is it historical market conditions the same as the future, you know, 
and, and to make that determination. So that's one big one. I think the other one that's really easy to kind of spot, if you're looking at evaluation and you have all the methods that we talked about, an appraiser might come up with a value under each method. And, uh, you know, I'll give a drastic example. If under the income approach, they say the business is worth $5 million, and under the market approach, they say the business is worth $10 million, and they take an average of that. Uh, that's not really a reliable indication of value. It would just be like your realtor telling you, hey, your house is either worth 500000 or a million. Why don't you list it for seven fifty? I think we would all kind of say, you know, that's that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right. And it's the same thing uh, with valuation. Huh. I bet you get asked this a lot, but how can a business owner increase the value of their business before a sale? Well, the first thing is to think about that two or three years before you go to sell the business because sure. uh, you know you see that a lot where they haven't prepared the business for sale. And one of the you know a little bit even outside of business valuation is cleaning up your books. So a lot of times with the smaller businesses, they don't have clean books for a buyer to step in and be able to really assess the health of the company. So that might be you know removal of discretionary expenses, uh, you know accrual basis accounting things of that nature that are going to, that a buyer is going to really need, um, you know, operationally, the best thing you can do, especially for the smaller businesses is become almost unnecessary to that business because there's a big distinction between your return on your labor and your return on you know, your equity. So a lot of these smaller businesses, a lot of times you're more or less buying a job and that's not as valuable as buying a business where, you know, you can step away and you have a management team that's in place that can run that business for you. And the smaller businesses, a lot of time, the owner is so critical that it really makes it difficult to sell um, when they look to do that because there's no business without the owner. Uh, right. And as you can strengthen that management team, you'll kind of give a, a new buyer that transition plan uh, that they're looking for. How many, um, how much time would you say a business owner should prepare if they want to do a transaction or I would assume it'd be different for something like gifting, but if they did want to do some kind of liquidity event and wanted evaluation, how much time ahead of that sort of target date should they really be thinking about these types of things, whether it's cleaning up internally, gathering document documents, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's generally they say about, you know, a six to 12 month process to sell a, a private business. What I would, you know, also encourage is if you have the time, you know, you get evaluation early on in that process, you can understand how, you know, a buyer might look at that business. Really encourage, you know, a lot of the, the private business owners out there, their biggest asset is this business and they might not have any idea of what it's worth. And when you think about that uh, in comparison to your brokerage account, where you get a statement every month, let's say, of, of the value of that. You know, some business owners, you know, 70, 80 percent of their net worth is tied up in this business and they don't have any idea what it's worth. And that can be challenging, one, when you go to sell it. But two, you know, the proceeds, can I survive off the proceeds of the sale based on what the business has been paying me and you know, the return I can earn uh, with proceeds post sale? So. It's always a good idea uh, to have a idea of what your business is worth, whether you're preparing for a sale or not. It's, you know, it's usually one of your biggest assets. And as you go through that process, you can say, oh, this is how you know, a buyer would probably look at it. Here's how I can start to uh, clean up my business, you know, increase cash flow, clean up my books, because you'll get into this concept of, of add backs in business valuation where we're adding back expenses. But I think what gives more certainty to a buyer rather than adding them back at closing is to show that your business was able to perform to the same level or better without those expenses um, in place to begin with, let's say for a year or two. Okay, so last question. I know you've been doing this a long time. So what, what should a business owner look for when they're choosing a professional to conduct evaluation? I think, you know, it comes down to the ability of that professional to communicate simply how value is, is driven, right? To be accessible, to be open to having a conversation with them, to not be, you know, closed minded that, you know, they are correct and, you know, you are the client and this is my report and, you know, take it or leave it. 
but it should be a collaborative process in which you know you are learning about the business you are giving them you know some feedback on what you're seeing you know maybe you give them pushback on certain responses they give but you should look for someone that can provide you know not only the the report right but can stand behind and explain why they've come to the assumptions they have because without being able to support those assumptions is kind of numbers in numbers out and when they get the report the report should really be a, a living document that can you know I, I always say to our team if you go back from two years from now you look at that report can you understand why you did what you did so if you get a you know if you should ask for maybe a sample report right see what the appraiser is proposing to deliver to you mm -hmm. Because a lot of times uh, for the clients, it's their first time going through the process and they don't even know what they're paying for, what they're engaging someone for. So a sample report's always good to have you know, the CV to see how long they've been doing it. Do they have a team in place? Um, because it's always better to have a few people, a few eyes on it. You know, there's a lot of numbers. There's, there's the um, potential for you know, mistakes to be made. So. For example, here we have at least four people always look at the valuation to make sure you know nothing slips through the cracks and there's that quality control. And it makes sense. Yeah. Great. Well, that was great information, Brian. Uh, I appreciate it. I learned something today, so I think that's always good news. Um, thank you so much for joining us and talking about this timely topic, providing your insights to the lodging industry. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for having me. If you have any questions about today's podcast, please reach out to us at www.withem.com backslash hospitality.